absolutely know one thing for sure about each and every one of you. <laughs> All of you eat something somewhere at some point on a regular basis. Another thing I know with absolute certainty is that the future of food for all of us will be different. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm an optimist. I'm convinced that even in the face of massive population growth, soil depletion, water scarcity, peak phosphorus, corporate consolidation, and climate change, I think we're gonna be okay. However, we are at a point that we need to tear up the sheets on how things have been and start fresh. It's vitally important that we do not underestimate this challenge. Here in Canada, where we enjoy so much abundance, it would be easy to be complacent. The rest of the world cannot afford for us to do that. With great strength comes great responsibility. Today, we've reached limits to growth with the old tools on the established pathways. We need to make exponentially more food available from exponentially less resources. From here, incremental advances are inadequate to address the threats we face. 100 years ago, people lived in a local and linear world. For the most part, only things within a day's walk or ride had any meaningful impact on your daily life. The world was experientially very big, and the entire planet had only slightly more people than China alone does today. As this hundred years has passed, the corn produced from a piece of land has increased sixfold. Wheats increased fourfold, both barley and oats threefold. We've doubled the milk we get from a cow in a day, and we've doubled the finish weight of both beef cows and chickens while wildly reducing the time it gets, takes to get to market for both. Do you know it takes just 18 months now for a beef cow to get to processing weight? And for a broiler chicken, as little as four weeks? Today, these gains have slowed or stopped with only nominal advances or worse. Many reports are published now showing the rising CO2 rates are shifting the makeup of plants, driving carbohydrates at the expense of, of protein, iron, and zinc. This is a threat that we don't notice on our plates, but in the doctor's office. We've been able to increase yields, but we've seen nutrition values slide. We are not okay on either quantity or quality. Where things got really tough in the last 100 years, we've gone from 1.6 to 7.6 billion people. For everybody alive on the earth today to get just the per person calories that the developed world was getting in 1900, we need to increase our supply by 47 and a half times what we had then, all from the same one planet. This is a hard data fact and thankfully only part of the equation. I'm trusting technology to give us the tools we need so we can reboot. All the above is true and verifiable. Making it harder is that we humans are fabulously wasteful. Globally, right now, today, one third of all food produced is wasted. 33% is a lot, and we need to solve that immediately, but that's just looking at food once it's food. Upstream, parts of the production system are much worse. Cows. When looking at waste in the food production system, they're simply the best bad example. I've got nothing against them personally. I let the data speak. A dairy cow uses just 40% of the plant energy that it eats, venting the rest from its front and back ends. 60% losses. It uses or converts just 15% of the plant nutrients it eats. 85% losses. When looking at beef cows, it takes 15 kilo of feed to get one kilo of meat. This is not sustainable. 
Yes, some of the throughput gets used again in conventional production, but cycling through a series of woefully inefficient systems, polluting our air, soil, and water. I've been working on the cow part of things for more than a decade as the poop soup guy. 2006, I started a deep dive, and today you might say I know my subject matter. 2008, I built something called an anaerobic digester where I cook my soup, producing renewable natural gas for about 1,000 customers. We also make a safe, plant-available, non-stinky manure-based fertilizer for vegetable growers. This is the beginning of a solution, harvesting pieces of the energy and nutrients. As much as can be done at the back end of a cow, 90% of the energy waste is methane that comes out of its mouth. It burps. And it's just not practical to capture that. <laughs> a single dairy cow eating the now common high milk production rations can produce up to 400 liters of methane a day, belching. If used for electricity production, that's enough to power a small fridge. Each one can power a small fridge. This methane problem is not just cows. Like I said, they're just the best bad example. This is a net-net waste of resources that's damaging our environment. If we will feed the world and maintain a planet, we will reduce our reliance on animals. So the great reboot of agriculture, what will it look like? It won't be a reboot and a refresh. It'll be a reboot and a reformat, seeing us start with a clean slate and new ways of thinking. Thankfully, some are working on this already. We're closely watching groups like the Open Agriculture Initiative, MIT, and the Indoor Agriculture Movement championed by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. They're developing the information-based tools we need so that we can Reboot. My personal work is through a program called Technology Meets Permaculture, where we use the explosion of information in a better way to look at the whole big picture. We have the power in our hands to fully, completely understand all of nature and our bodies. We can then use that information to give them what they need rather than trying to force them to submit to what we want. As we move into this new paradigm, we have to ensure that our decisions are hard data-driven, but do your own research. Don't just search opinions and statistics. Numbers can be made to say anything if you torture them long enough, and many do. The world stage of information is very, very noisy and quite unreliable. Apparently, even the great visionary Abraham Lincoln warned us, don't believe everything you read on the internet. In the future of food internet noise, there is much ado about GMOs. Some are saying they're 100% safe and the only way out of our challenges. Others are saying they'll be the death of us all. I'm not taking a position on the topic because I have read a lot from both sides and I'm not fully convinced by either. I do know this, it was still common practice when I was a kid to prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics as a precautionary measure to someone who's just not feeling well. Glyphosate is a broad-spectrum systemic herbicide and plant desiccant. It makes them dry up and die. Like broad-spectrum antibiotics, it kills indiscriminately. Globally, glyphosate use has increased nearly 15-fold since 1996, when plants genetically engineered to be ready for it were introduced. Advances in life science are showing us the importance of good bacteria in our bodies. That's why we're moving away from general human antibiotic use. It's also showing us the importance of good bugs and bacteria in nature. This is a piece of the equation that needs to be watched very carefully. There's a lot of other ideas being bounced around too, like clean meat. 2011, Mark Post gave us our first lab-grown burger. Cost over $300,000 to make from animal cells and reportedly didn't taste very good. Today, a company called Impossible Foods makes a burger that looks like meat, 
tastes like meat, even feels like meat in your mouth, but is 100% plants, so needs no cows at all. The day I checked their website, you could order in 291 locations for about 12 bucks. There's a lot of noise on the internet about insects as our protein source. It's totally normal for many people around the world to eat bugs, and while it may not look like this for us in the short term, it's already here in products like this. Sure, there's still a yuck factor for some, but only in the West, and that's falling away. For me personally, I'm betting on a, on a fast-growing aquatic grass called duckweed. It's a tiny floating plant that we grow in stacks of trays under lights inside shipping containers, producing food while we clean the wastewater and the air from a land-based fish farm. Our design model says we can produce at least a thousand times as much food from a footprint as anyone with, can with corn or soy. It's for sure the world's least sexy aquaponics system, but I recently learned NASA's looking at it as a promising space food, so I'm encouraged. The great master of veggie protein, Eve Potvin, told me that if I can make it taste like nothing, he can make it taste like anything. I know for sure it'll be emotionally easier for us to eat grass than grasshoppers. Now, for what may be the next giant leap in food production, to think really big, we got to get super small. There's a group of microbes called methanotrophs. They're tiny methane-eating, protein-pooping bugs. Microorganisms that convert natural gas to chemical building blocks that can be food. Remember the food versus fuel debates a little while ago? As we get better at harvesting renewable energy and the values drop, the world's taking another look at fuel to food. First attention back in the 70s, but then cheap soybeans and expensive energy knocked it out. Today, the tables have turned. Major advantage, this uses 77 to 98% less water than common agriculture products. Some are saying this method can produce 10,000 times as much food from a footprint as corn or soy, and in a perfect world, I'm gonna produce it in methane I captured from the farm that I'm making the new feed for, and I'll have enough protein left over to supply all the people of a big city. This will shift things by a magnitude. Uh, uh, recently, uh, a group of companies joined forces, raised $30 million to develop production for animal feed. It's simply advanced fermentation, and I think we'll all celebrate the day when our protein comes from here instead of here, if it tastes good. So the great reboot of agriculture, it's unavoidably on the way. I don't profess to have the answers to all that it will be, but I do know for sure that it will be different. How things are done today simply cannot continue. I said earlier, we're doing things to, to recover some of the waste, big parts of waste in the production systems, harvesting the energy and nutrients. We're creating pathways to progress, but we must also change our consumption. Will we get here, the replicator of Star Trek fame, delivering a full, complete meal at the utterance of a command? A company called Natural Machines says they're real close to a big breakthrough and they've got prototypes. Another company called Modern Meadows is already 3D printing leather replacement and can do food, but figured it was easier to market textiles for now. If we can already 3D print body parts and buildings, complete food's only a matter of time. We are close to that revolution. So remember at the beginning, I said, I think we're gonna be okay. Here's really why. We are being forced to change our food production by physical limitations of the planet. We now have the proliferation of information tools to help us holistically understand all that we are doing. Diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are now inextricably tied to diet. We're living in a time of demand for radical personal rights and it's making the world messy. We will solve all of the grand challenges of humanity when we shift to radical 
personal responsibility. Cost will always be a part of our buying decisions, but now as we're seeing the health impact of what we eat, we're understanding that the wrong food, even if it's cheap to buy, can be tragically expensive. Please, let's all use the amazing tools we have to understand all of nature and our bodies. We eaters, by changing what we buy, can steer food production to wellness. Truly, the world is in our hands, and with great strength comes great responsibility. It's time to reboot.